Hello everyone. In this video, we are going to talk about acceleration measurement devices, a couple of them, uh, namely accelerometers and seismometers. And just again, pictures and equations are taken from the book Elements of Vibrations by Leonard Mayrovich. So, a, a simple accelerometer, uh, if it has mechanical components, it would look like something like this. So you have a um, platform that you attach to the object that you want to measure its vibrations and let's say the acceleration of it or the motion of it or something and inside of it you can have a mass spring damper system like this so we have this suspended mass that can only go up and down and uh, typically there is a guide here that basically this mass can only go up and down along this guide and then you have the spring and damper attaching it to the platform the motion of the platform that you are interested to measure is y of t. The absolute motion of that. The absolute motion of the mass is x of t, but the, the thing you can measure is the relative motion between this mass and this platform, which we call z of t. So z of t is what you can uh, typically measure, the relative motion. And you can see that the absolute motion of the mass is its relative motion plus the motion of the platform. So x equals y plus z. Okay, so again, this is the one you want to uh, measure. This is the one that you can measure, typically using uh, piezoelectric components. So if I write the equation of uh, motion for this mass... Uh, for x and here we measure x from equilibrium static equilibrium then the only two forces on this mass are the damper force and this um, spring force and here you can either assume x is bigger than y or y bigger than x it's not going to make any difference so if you assume that x is bigger than y then since this mass is moving up more than this uh, this end point on the top of the spring is moving more than this bottom point so if you look at the free body diagram, the force of the spring is going to be downward, right? And that is going to be K times X minus Y. And on the other end, since uh, you have, uh, again, these two ends, and this top end is the same as this bottom one. They are both attached to the platform. So this motion is also Y of T, right? And this bottom motion is X of T. And in this case, again, remember, we assume X is bigger than Y. So uh, this top point moves more than this uh, attachment point. Therefore, the force of damper is also downward. And that is basically is going to be C times um, X dot minus what uh, minus Y dot. Okay. So uh, if you write the equation of motion, it's going to be mx double dot equals negative kx minus y negative cx dot minus y dot. If you, uh, right, so let me write it for you. And if you bring in those negative terms to the left hand side, then you will get this equation number two, as you can see. Right, so this is going to be the equation that you have too, and here you use the notation z because this guy here is z and this guy is z dot. And x double dot, based on the relation that we have, remember that x is what y plus z here. So if you take two time derivatives. From this equation one, if you take a, a double time derivative, what would you get? You get x double dot equals what equals y double dot plus z double dot. Right? So uh, then mx double dot here is going to be my double dot minus mz double dot. Right? A uh, plus z double dot. I'm sorry. My bad. Uh, y double dot plus z double dot and then you see here you will have mz double dot and then again you bring these two terms to the other end you get k times z plus c times z dot so you get this one 
And this term here, m y double dot, you have to take to the other side. So it becomes negative m y double dot, and you get this uh, equation here in the red box. And clearly, this is a force vibration of a single degree of freedom system where the uh, excitation comes from negative m y double dot here. And now here, uh, for simplicity of uh, basically estimations and calculations, we assume that this y motion here is harmonic. Okay, that's not always the case. If this motion is harmonic, then we can easily get a solution for this uh, for, uh, uh, damp system vibration, right? This is a mass spring damper system with uh, excitation. And uh, in this case, so we assume that Y is uh, basically the harmonic excitation has an amplitude Y naught and E to the I omega T. Or you can write it as sine omega T, doesn't matter. Here is a complex form of it. If that's the case, then y double dot, as you know, is always going to be negative y naught omega squared, right? This y double dot, based on this notation, it's going to be negative y naught omega squared times y of t. Okay, so that negative and that negative would cancel each other, so you get m omega uh, squared y naught, that is the amplitude, times uh, e to the i omega t. Right, and you know the response of this system based on what you know from vibrations is Z of T equals what? Equals. So this is your what? This is your amplitude. So we can see that amplitude here, a portion of it, the M will be hidden inside this magnitude G of J omega as well as uh, omega N squared. And this uh, same frequency omega t exists, but with a phase shift of phi, where the phi phase shift comes from this arctangent formula, and the magnitude g omega, magnitude the amplification factor, comes from this formula. And again, we have both of these in vibrations, right? You, you learn both of these. And remember, your omega n squared is what? Omega n squared is k over m, right? So when you have 1 over omega n squared like here, it's going to be m over k. So that m is going to be multiplied by what? Omega times, uh, y naught times omega squared, and that is exactly this term here. So you see, this term here, this amplitude, is the same as this guy, which is m amplified by magnitude gj omega, and the phase of the system is changed from 0 to phi, okay? So this is your basic vibrations that you had. Now, how do we do the measurements? Because again, what we can measure is this Z of T and we can measure its amplitude, right? We can measure the amplitude of it. Probably we might be able to measure the phase of it, but most of the time, the only thing we can measure is this amplitude because we have piezoelectric components, compression type, that based on how much this relative motion is, they can produce a, a, a basically proportional uh, voltage, right? So basically proportional to this uh, entity here, this amplitude, they can uh, produce what? Produce some voltage here. Okay, so if we can measure this, now how can we infer what? How can we infer the motion of the... Um, Platform. How can we uh, infer anything about this y of t? Either y of t or y double dot of t, right? If you want to get the motion or if you want to get the acceleration, right? It's an accelerometer or if it's a motion. Is there anything we can do? Yes. Well, how? If I go ahead and plot this here, if I call this total amplitude z naught, okay? If I call it z naught, right? Uh, times this whole thing. So I call this whole total modified amplitude, this whole thing, I call it Z naught. Then the ratio of Z naught over Y naught, which is going to be omega over omega n squared times magnitude of GJ omega, which is this guy. If I plot this function times omega over omega n squared, right? If I plot it for different values of uh, zeta for different values of damping ratio, these are different kind of curves that you will get. 
which is again z naught is the amplitude of the response y naught is the amplitude of the excitation okay and here again this is basically omega over omega n squared times the magnitude of g of i omega right so i'm plotting this and you can see for different things okay and this is that just omega over omega n squared this is just this term here. Now, what's the special about here? The special thing is, if we look at small values of omega, if we come and look at this left region here, where omega over omega n is very small. Why? Because we can make this omega n to be very large. If we make this omega n to be very large, that means we can have omega over omega n to be small numbers in general, like uh, in this case here. So we can have it less than 1 or less than 0.5 or something. If you look in very small uh, values uh, for omega, if you look at this magnitude of g of j omega, it's very close to 1. You see, it's very close to 1 specifically if your damping ratio is around 0.7 then you see for a good range here you see almost to here or maybe even up to 0.4 for a very good region between 0 to 0.4 you can have what you can have almost uh, exactly equal to one with less than one percent error as long as, as I said, your omega is between 0 to 0.4 or so, that is very good. Especially, as I said, when it's close to 0.7. Okay? If that's the case, that means this guy here is almost 1. Right? This guy here is 1. So the z naught that you measure is simply just what? y naught times omega over omega n squared, which is what you can see here in formula 3. Right? So your z naught is going to be what? It's going to be that guy. Now, remember uh, this omega n squared, the reciprocal of that was k over m. So this guy is also equal to what? Equals to k times what? m y naught omega squared. Right? Or uh, this m actually, this k which has to go in the denominator like that. Or since M and K are under your control, they have nothing to do with the excitation YT. If we just uh, ignore this constant M over K, right? Or say it's proportional to, is proportional to clearly Y naught over omega squared. And what is Y naught over omega squared? Remember, we just said that this Y double dot of T is what? negative omega naught omega squared times y naught right times y of t so you see the magnitude of acceleration is what ne uh, y naught times omega squared right so this guy is what this guy the z naught is going to be now proportional to what magnitude of acceleration so if the omega is a small or mostly omega is mostly not under your control. It comes from the platform. In order to have omega over omega n to be small, you need to pick a large omega n. You need to have this denominator very large. If that denominator is very large, then this amplitude that you measure with your piezoelectric is proportional to magnitude of acceleration of the platform therefore we call this device a what we call it an accelerometer yes so you see why we call it accelerometer because this amplitude of those electric uh, voltage that you measure or z naught is proportional to magnitude of acceleration of the object yes so for this device to work as we said we need bigger big omega ends how big Typically, for most of the accelerometers, we choose large numbers like 30,000 hertz or something, or bigger than that for omega n. 
And big omega n, you know, it means what? It means the spring has to be very stiff in that system and the mass has to be small because omega n is what? Square root k over m. So if I want this guy to go up, k has to go up and m has to go down. So that's why since they have small masses, most of the time these accelerometers, if you look at their pictures, they are also what? They are also very small too in size. And many times they have small damping too, although uh, if you want good measurements, you might want to pick what? You might want to pick uh, 0.7 really, not very, very small. Okay, so if you want to have small percentage of error, maybe you choose your C so that the zeta, and remember zeta was what? It was C over 2 square root km. So if you can approximate this by 0.7, then in a good range of frequencies, you're good. And what is a good range? Well, if your omega n is 30,000 and this ratio is 0.4, you're looking at 0.4 times 30,000, which is what? Which is, yes, 12,000 hertz. But most of the time, to make it more accurate, do you see their, their operating range is max at uh, 5,000 hertz or something? So this ratio is like 1 over 6. So they come somewhere like here. So something like this. Okay. Uh, 0.2, 0 0.16 are here. So they come to somewhere like there, which you can see this G magnitude G, G omega is very close to 0.1. And that makes for very good approximation. By the way, I said these are small things. And uh, this... Uh, Piezoelectric, I just uh, got this picture from the web, just wanted to show you. So this is an example of one of these, okay? This is a piezoelectric uh, accelerometer, and there are other ones too, but uh, not inside all of them you might see the same mechanism. So this is the, um, the reason that this was chosen for this video was um, this teaches you a lot about the mechanical vibrations, okay? So um, this is what, this is, as I said, a uh, simple um, piezoelectric accelerometer that uh, you might see in uh, many devices, okay? Now, uh, let's uh, talk about one other thing here. And the other thing is, um, this was for a... a very large omega n or small ratio on the other hand on the other hand if you look at this graph and let me do a little bit cleaning here it's too busy if you look at this graph here on a large omega over omega n ratios on this side of the graph if you look the amplitude z naught over amplitude y naught for uh, regardless of what zeta that you choose they all approach one they all approach unity is that a nice thing if that is the case that means your uh, z naught is almost the same as y naught what does that mean? It means this uh, amplitude that you are measuring with your piezo voltage is now, instead of being proportional to acceleration, as we had earlier, right, in equation 3, as being proportional to acceleration, now it's directly proportional to the motion itself. So now you are directly measuring displacement instead of acceleration. And those cases are what we call what? A seismometer. A seismometer is when this ratio is very large or omega n is very what? Very small. Like what? Like between 2 to 5 hertz. Which means a very weak spring and a large mass. Or if you don't want a very large mass, your spring has to be very, very small. Okay, so k here has to be what? A small number. And omega is uh, typically much bigger than omega n. So they are like 10 to 500 hertz or something. Okay, so you see the minimum ratio here is like 2. The maximum ratio could be like uh, 250 or so. So it's anywhere from here onward, but typically 2 is not a good. So the minimal go from 4 or 5 and above. And in that range, this approximation of that by 1 is very, very reasonable. 
Okay, so seismometers are the ones that are measuring motion instead of acceleration, and they need a small omega. Now, one last thing is everything started from one assumption, and we assume that the platform motion, the excitation motion, is harmonic. Who said it's always harmonic? The matter of fact is it's not always harmonic. Many times that excitation could be non-harmonic. It could be any general function, right? Then what? Can we use any of these results that we have seen so far? And the answer is, well, first of all, if the function is not harmonic, we can approximate it by a bunch of major harmonics using what? If I have this y of t, right, versus time, if I have this y of t, some function like this, right, and it's not a harmonic function or it's something like that, can you still convert it to a bunch of harmonics? Yes. What? Using what? There we go. You are right. Using what? Using the Fourier transform. Okay, so using Fourier transform, this function can be written as a bunch of major harmonics. Then what? Can we use the results that we have obtained? Not that easy. Why not? For simplicity, let's say your function can be approximated by just for simplicity and just a couple of harmonics, omega 1 and omega 2, with their magnitudes y1 and y2. Okay. In general, you, have, you need to write a bunch of more harmonics. Two is not enough to go for any general function. And the more sharp edges that function has, you need more harmonics to go with a good approximation. But let's say, just for the sake of uh, showing you what happens, let's say your function is made of two harmonics. What happens now? Then the measurement that you get, the z of t that you get, the y approximated, is going to be y1... And uh, here, I assume something is missed. It should be magnitude of g of i omega at omega 1. And this should be magnitude of g of i omega 2 times 1, 2 times cosine of omega 1 minus phi 1 omega 2t minus phi 2. Okay? Now, here, you see that this cosine of phi 1 and phi 2 get on the way. And it's not as simple as saying this y of uh, this y measurement that you have is simply proportional to what? Proportional to y1 plus y2 or multiplied each one by their own g of i omega, whether this number is close to 1 or not. So even if you say this omega 1 and omega 2 are far less than omega n, so these two magnitude g omegas are both approximated by one. Still, this guy here is not simply proportional to y1. You see that? Because here you have cosine and sine of this angle that will be multiplied by y1. That phi cannot be just thrown away. Okay? Why? Because they are different phi's. If they were the same phi, maybe, but here they are different phi's. And so, in this case, there is what we call distortion. You cannot easily uh, uh, estimate anything or uh, infer anything about y1 and y2 just by looking at ya. That's very hard. Unless there are some specific scenarios. What are some scenarios? One scenario is when your damping ratio is zero. If damping ratio is zero, going back and looking at the phi formula, this is going to be tangent inverse of zero, so your phi is going to be simply zero. And if phi is zero, then guess what? Okay, this is much easier. This uh, z is going to be much easier to infer anything about y1 and y2 because now they are cosine omega 1t and cosine omega 2t. Okay? Yes? 
and maybe your omega 1 and omega 2 you can uh, get from some uh, Fourier analysis or something right so if you can apply some Fourier analysis to your platform you might get the major harmonics in it but remember what we need to find are y1 and y2 and uh, it, it is much easier you have less variables to be concerned about another case is when this uh, omega over omega n is small which uh, we assume it is right remember we assume the omega over omega n is small we are looking at the uh, accelerometer case if that's small what happens well let's go back and look so here we assume that this ratio omega over omega n is small going close to zero so this denominator goes to one the numerator goes to zero so the whole thing goes to zero yes so your phi is going close to zero right for small ratios of omega over omega n if that's the case as we said phi is very close to zero so sine of phi can be approximated by phi and cosine of phi because it's small can be approximated by one minus phi squared on the other hand <laughs> If we uh, look at the formula for phi, we'll see that for small values of what? For small values of uh, omega or omega over omega n, for small values of omega, phi 1 can be approximated by what? By C omega in general, phi can be approximated by C omega. So phi of 1 can be approximated by C omega 1, phi 2 can be approximated by C omega 2, right? So these are some approximations. Now tangent of phi, which is sine over cosine, and remember sine is the same as phi, and phi is approximated by C omega, and cosine is approximated by 1 minus phi uh, squared over 2, which now phi is uh, C omega squared over 2. But the formula for phi itself, for tangent of phi, sorry, the formula for tangent of phi from here is clearly what? If you take a tangent from both sides of this, let me, oh gosh, sorry. If you take a tangent from both sides of this, this is tangent of phi. So it's 2 zeta omega over omega n divided by 1 minus that same ratio squared. If you set these two equal to each other, you see that the scenario for this to be applicable, the scenario for this approximation to be applicable requires a what? Requires a damping ratio of square root 2 over 2 or 0 0.707. So if that's the case, then these phase shifts are again proportional to each other. So one is C omega 1, the other one is C omega 2. So if you know omega 1 and omega 2, you can easily go about calculating phi 1 and phi 2. And once you know phi 1 and phi 2, again, coming back to this formula here, uh, since you know these phi's, uh, estimating the values of y1, y2, or y1 times omega 1 squared and y2 times omega 2 squared from the sense motion is much easier because you have less variables to be concerned about. Because these phase shifts that are not equal, they are either zero or they are uh, proportional to each other. So that makes life uh, a lot easier to do. And you might say, how come phi is approximated by C omega? Well, uh, here I can uh, ask you to take a look at this, right? So if you simplify this guy here, right, what would you get? So you get 2 xi, remember xi is 2 over square root k times m. Let's keep the omega as is, and omega n here is what? Is square root k over m, right? So what would you get? This k and this k go, that 2 and that 2 go, and here you see the proportionality of what? This uh, c times omega, okay? It can be approximated by right and uh, that's what we talked about so 
Hopefully this video was useful to you. You learned some basics about accelerometers and seismometers. And I'll see you in the next video. Thank you.